Until recently, Nigeria was only a transit country for drug peddling and illicit use. But that status, I'm afraid, has changed as drug abuse has reached an epidemic level. Cannabis or marijuana, known by various local names, Igbo, Wee Wee, and so on, used to be the major drug of abuse until evolving trend towards non-medical use of prescription drugs. Now, according to the UNODC, Nigerian drug trafficking networks fuel both local and international drugs markets. That's right. Now, drug abuse is a major disturbing public health issue at the moment. It may be a global problem, but sadly, there is yet no known cure for addiction. <clears throat> drug abuse is likened to a canker worm that has eaten deep into the fabric of the Nigerian nation. It may be prevalent in most parts of the country, but available records indicate that the scourge may be worse in the northern part of the country, of course, fueled by insurgency and high poverty rate. But another worrisome development is the swelling population of female drug peddlers. Many lives have been lost, sanity destroyed, and homes wrecked by illicit use and abuse of drugs by women and the young. Unfortunately, many collaborative initiatives by political leaders, women groups, not-for-profit organizations, international agencies, and civil societies to tackle the menace are only yielding slow results. But the Buhari administration says it will not relent in the fight against drug abuse and have taken steps further by constituting a panel of presidential advisors to come up with practical ways of fighting the scourge. And so in December 2018, the Presidential Advisory Committee on Elimination of Drug Abuse was inaugurated by the President. While receiving the report of the panel, the President said, and I quote, Winning the war against drug abuse becomes one of the critical elements of the next level mandate of this administration, unquote. Our findings, he continues, have shown that it is more difficult to bring crime rate to acceptable levels without clearing our country of substances abuse, unquote. So, on late edition this week, we engage chairman of PASIDA, that's the Presidential Advisory Committee on Elimination of Drug Abuse, on their findings and what prospects there are to realize in the President's wish, or should I say, our own wish. I am Claire Adilabu Abdurazak, thanking you for joining me on this week's edition of the program. If you've ever lived or have experienced the nightmarish traffic gridlock that characterizes commuting in the city of Lagos, then you must be conversant with the three-wheeler, tricycle, or auto rickshaws locally known as Kekemarwa, which has been a major source of livelihood for many, many indigent Nigerians. Now, auto rickshaw or Kekemarwa was first introduced in Lagos as a poverty alleviation measure by my guest on late edition this week. My guest also endeared himself to the people of Lagos and indeed to you know, other people in other parts of the country. But in Lagos, by his famous Operation Sweep Security Outfit to rid Lagos State of Crimes. Now you know who I'm talking about. Mohamed Buba Marwa is a retired Nigerian military officer who rose to the rank of Brigadier General before retiring. He was military governor of Bruno and, as I said, earlier on, Lagos states between 1991 and 1999, and that's during military administrations of General Ibrahim Babangida and late Sani Abacha. He started his military career from the Nigerian Military School in Zaria, Nigerian Defense Academy in Kaduna, before proceeding to the Pittsburgh University, where he obtained a master's degree in international relations, and of course, a second master's degree in public administration from the prestigious Harvard University. 
Mohamed Bubamara held various posts in the Nigerian Army. He was academic registrar of the Nigerian Defense Academy, deputy defense advisor in the Nigerian Embassy in the Washington, D.C., defense advisor to the Nigerian Permanent Mission to the United Nations, but that's in 1992. And in 2007, he was Nigeria's commissioner to the Republic of South Africa. Now, on retiring from military service, Mohamed Bubamarwa is currently leading a panel engaged with the responsibility of finding actionable ways of eliminating the scourge of drug abuse in Nigeria. Please join me as I welcome Chairman, Presidential Advisory Committee on the Elimination of Drug Abuse in Nigeria, Procedure. Mohamed Buba Marwa to late edition. Good to have you with us. Thank you very much for joining me. Glad to me. be here. Let me just begin by, you know, having you share your experience with us. I know in the course of the travels to the different parts of the country, you know, undertaking this assignment, was there any, at any point that you saw something that torched you, something that probably humbled you? Well, um, in the course of our uh, trips and visitations across the country to engage with states, local governments, and communities, I think uh, maybe two areas stand out to my memory at this time. In Kano, I had uh, I have sought to engage with drug addicts in the most drug addict reading local government. So we're taken to Fage. Hmm. Uh, and there we were addressing like 500 drug uh, addicts in, in the room. Um, that, that was quite a scary and noisy uh, session there um, that we went through it. And I think the other one that... Uh, when you say scary, so retired Brigadier General Yes, scary, yes. not in the, not in the mm -hmm. sense of uh, uh, violence yes. or attack, yes. but, but the level that some Nigerian youths have fallen to. Mm -hmm. Very scary to look at and say, wait a minute, these are all children uh, with, with uh, parents, you know, who ought to have been doing better things with their lives, you know, married or in schools. But here they are in, in, a, in a state of absolute depravity. That's the scare, scariness mm. I'm referring to. Mm. And of course, that reminded me of Lagos, the area boys mm. and girls, mm. who we were able to bring back from the brink, rehabilitate, and provide for to become normal, useful citizens of society. That was that. And uh, the other one was actually in my home state, to my surprise. Uh, holding a meeting, I believe, with district heads. They said uh, there's a part of Jimeta. Mm. Right there, Jimeta, the state capital, called it to Sambisa. I'm sure the word Sambisa brings some memories. That's a den of drug addicts who have established a community and law unto themselves. And he told me that they had met, made representations on several occasions to the police uh, to, to get in there and clear them out. And the police had indicated weariness in doing that because that was like a no-go area. Area, you know, right there they hold their own uh, little court sessions to try offenders. They smoke and do stuff as they wish marry, uh, whole marriage uh, ceremonies and so on. <clears throat> it was a whole community. On the That's right, and right there. Um, but I quickly dealt with it. And later that evening, I called a meeting of the brigade commander, the air force commander, the commissioner of police, NATO SSS. Um, we discussed it, and I said they have to get hold of the situation and clear that place. Were you able to elicit anything, you know, from them? Like, you know, what was the issue with them? Why did they, you know, decide to do drugs? 
Oh, yeah. That's a subject that we can talk about mm. because the whole ambit of drug abuse, the whole matter of broken families, poverty, lack of jobs, idleness, frustration, broken families, a whole gamut of issues. <clears throat> Chief of them being poverty and idleness out of uh, unemployment and so on. But then what was important was that they moved around freely in town, brandishing weapons, uh, you know, stabbing people at will, seizing, almost akin to the area boy syndrome at the time of my taking over the assignment in Lagos. But I'm happy to say that the security agencies, uh, as I mentioned after that meeting, uh, a couple of days later, they, they went to it and cleared the place. And those uh, who were arrested faced prosecution um, through the NDLEA at the time. Maybe these are the two uh, cases that immediately uh, strike me. Of, of course, what, what, what I was they, also surprised some of the states, complete states, didn't have a single rehabilitation center for the youths. That was another uh, thing that, that, that surprised me completely. Mm. But yeah, that was quite an experience. It's one thing to be in Abuja, meet the stakeholders in a cozy atmosphere, discuss mm. and so on, and quite another mm. Between, when you're on the ground. Yes, I, I was going to ask, you know, mm -hmm. how, what you saw, what emotions did it evoke in you? What, 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 where were your thoughts in terms of responsibilities? Pity and sadness, but you see, we have to be honest with ourselves. And I'll speak from the perspective of an official who ran state governments before. The tendency in the executive branch at all levels is to focus on tangible things. Hmm. If you're a governor or a chairman or something, you want to, to say, I did so many roads or bridges, so many schools, uh, hospitals, you know, tangibles. You are not very uh, keen normally on how many drug addicts did you rehabilitate? Hmm. That, that's not an attractive... Uh, so it goes back to the character of the person. Especially when the electoral process that brought about a chief, chief executive was fraudulent, which for the most part uh, used to be the case. Of course, after Jega and the uh, new uh, cadres and so on, things have begun to move forward. But in the past, you sat down and, and uh, they wrote the results in your front as a governor or whatever, and you paid for it. So it was your money that brought you to office. Mm. Therefore, you didn't care about the citizenry. <clears throat> they could go to blazes. And in any case, a lot of people think that uh, after they are the ones smoking or taking, uh, you know, read and so on, so it's their fault. Let them perish. Mm. Let, let, so let those are the issues. Mm. Let, let, me, let me detract a, a, a bit from the course of our discussion. I, I heard a, a particular chief executive, you know, speak about, you know, measures to alleviate poverty recently. And mention was made about, you know, you talked about tangible things, about, you know, road construction, about infrastructure development as, you know, a very critical element of poverty alleviation. From from your experience, you know, in taking up this Not assignment. Not yes. That's the focus of the executives tends to be on such things. I mean, mm -hmm. no, I, I was facing, just. Mm, I said some a particular chief executive okay, was, told you was that. yes was okay. saying, look, this is you know one way you can address poverty okay. by building you yes. know okay. roads mm -hmm. and other and other. Yeah, because it but jobs. Mm -hmm. it's, from your perspective, something mm -hmm. something much more you know, should, should be looked at? In the business of poverty elevation and the creation of jobs, the government has a very critical role to play. And that's why the president, um, including his budget, 100 million Nigerians out of poverty in the next 10 years. That means there's a 
betting that he will hand over to whoever <coughs> will come, you know, after him. Uh, certainly, as far as uh, job creation is concerned, universally, the private sector um, employs more with the government creating the necessary environment. Mm -hmm. Of course, the infrastructure work itself creates jobs like the buildings and roads and mm -hmm. so on. Yes, but, but by far, uh, what we need from government is to create that environment where, for instance, money could be cheap uh, in terms of borrowing, mm -hmm. and then you invest and create small and medium scale enterprises, which this government is doing. So that's critical. For, for this community of people. And in addition, mm -hmm. uh, giving skills. Mm -hmm. Giving skills so that they can themselves be self employed. Very important. That's what I was going to ask. For this community mm -hmm. of drug you know, users, mm -hmm. what kind of measure you know, would be appropriate for them? What kind of alleviation measure would be appropriate for them? Well, as I said, as far as the, if, if we're jumping to, the, to, to mm. the whole business of demand reduction, as far as the drug users are concerned, first is to eliminate the availability and access to drugs. Okay. And that is on its own. Second, you have to go on a very wide, powerful publicity and advocacy in all strata of society, from family to communities, the traditional institutions have their role, uh, religious leaders have their, their role, educational institutions, you know, it, it's a whole gamut there, civil society organizations, mm. regulatory agencies, media and publicity agencies like your good selves. Mm. That's another aspect. And then, of course, the whole matter of jobs. We have to face jobs, we have to face Poverty, and as I've said, the government will need to be macroeconomic measures that will stimulate the economy towards the creation. And mostly, it's private enterprises, and at their own local levels, and at the levels of the local government chairman, governor, you must be able to, in the process of rehabilitating drug addicts, mm. teach them skills, those of them who have nowhere to go, so that they can become useful members. And we did that for area boys, thousands of area boys. If you remember Lagos, 99% okay. of them mm. were on drugs. And the women didn't dare move around Lagos streets yes, with sir. trinkets yes. and night yes. bags and mm. stuff. Yes, I, I, I recollect Oshodi. That's the famous right. Oshodi. And even the under the bridge. In your car. Yes, they, they smashed the window. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we dealt with it. Um, treated, rehabilitated them, gave them skills, and we gave them some money. That, that gap, Start of grants. they always miss it, to my surprise. When you, when you teach somebody how to, how, to, how to get eggs out of chicken and so on, but you don't give him how to do it, the chicken itself, <laughs> to do it, but you've taught him how to do it and you release him, he, he, will, he will be back to the trade because he doesn't have anything to start off with. So these are, you know, issues. Mm. I've, I've, I've actually fast tracked our conversation, but let me mm -hmm. come back again. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I do not want to take it for granted that uh, when we talk about, um, you know, drug abuse, that everyone, you know, understands what it means. Uh, so that's what I'm going to ask you, because it seems the use of, you know, drug abuse or substance abuse has become contiguous. Uh, some people these days, you know, of course, you, you purchase OTC drugs. Uh, simple paracetamol, for instance, could be used, you know, in amounts that are not prescribed. So, what exactly do we? Let's understand what drug abuse really means. You know, when you use illicit substances, by virtue of the fact that they are illicit, and why they illicit because they affect the chemistry of the body, especially the brain, spinal cord system, and so on, with negative health issues to the organs. Mm. That's drug abuse, consuming illicit mm. substances. And when you consume illicit substances beyond the prescriptive uh, tendencies mm -hmm. by, by doctors. You're also liable. Definitely, that's drug abuse. For instance, the tramadol, 100 milligrams is the limit 
in Nigeria to be lawfully prescribed, but some pop 500 milligrams as drug abuse. Um, even the paracetamol you mentioned, <clears throat> maybe you are supposed to take two pills morning, two afternoon, two, two in the night, and you pop a dozen, that's drug abuse. So ultimately, and in the simplest terms, the consequences of the use of drug that are negative and inimical to, to the human self. being, which ultimately could lead to death. In fact, most, they talk of the organ, the liver, the heart, and so on. Death is the final end for, for these users. And we have to, uh, in addition to the behavioral consequences. Mm -hmm. So one in eight people uh, in Nigeria, through, through studies, have demonstrated that they've been affected by drug users mm. negatively mm. in society. Mm. So invariably, we, we, are, we are fighting both ends. We are fighting both ends. Certainly. Mm. So, when you took up this challenge, mm. what was the prompt for you? Was it the fact that you, you know, your success is in Lagos? Okay, if I could do it in Lagos, then at that time long ago, I could also do it. You see. Did you have a strategy? You see, one of the things I picked out of Harvard University was not necessarily the degree mm. and the certificate. Beautiful. There was a particular class I attended, I remember. I think it was Professor Nye, NYE. Um, I will not mention countries now, mm. but he now said, and he mentioned a country, that the difference between that country and the United States is that whether that country faces problems with the mindset of tolerating it, tolerating the problem and living with it. The United States face problems with the mindset of solving it. All problems have solutions, I'm telling you. So when you are faced with a challenge or a problem, you must face it to solve it not to debate and so on. And we've shown this, you know, we've, we've shown this. Even in Lagos, in the various strata, the, 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 the answer yes. is just that when you face a problem, solve it. So when we were given the assignment <clears throat> on the drug abuse, of course, my little experience before in Lagos came into play, but I had great people in the committee including Her Excellency, the First Lady, who is so committed and was actually the instigator of it. Her Excellency, one of the Vice President, they were with us throughout the work of the committee, chipping away, contributing. We had experts. The NDLA was there, Customs was there, Police was there, the Ministry of Justice, uh, Women Affairs, youth, health, education, the academia was represented, uh, by association was represented. There was a strong committee there. So it's important that it's not me <laughs> that brought about the conclusion of this work. And of course, SGS office, collectively we faced the challenge and we came out with recommendations which we believe, if implemented, by the grace of God, this problem will be solved. The key thing is the will from the president, which he has. Okay, let's put the chairman on hold. Uh, when we come back, we'll now look at, you know, your findings. You're watching the edition this week, and we're looking at Nigeria's drug war, and of course the findings of the Presidential Advisory Committee on the Diminution of Drug Abuse in Nigeria. Thank you, we'll be right back. This is NTA News 24, broadcasting from Abuja. You can watch us anywhere, anytime, on the following platforms.
more information, log on to our website www.nta.ng or join us on our social media handles Twitter at NTA News 24, Facebook at NTA News 24. For comments, suggestions, and inquiries, send an email to news24 at nta.gov.ng or call us on the following numbers. NTA News 24, news and more news. Thank you for joining me again. Uh, you're watching Late Edition this week. We're looking at Nigeria's war against drug abuse. And I have with me uh, Chairman of the Presidential Advisory Committee on Elimination of Drug Abuse in Nigeria, in the person of Mohamed Buba Marwa, Brigadier General, retired. Thank you once again for joining me. So let's get on now with our question. Yeah. A drug-free society is doable in Nigeria? Not 100%. We have to be frank with ourselves. It's like, can you have a zero corruption? No. <clears throat> so when our committee is named Presidential Advisory Committee for the Elimination of Drug Abuse, mm -hmm. we came under fire so many, you know, in, including the international <laughs> community. Yeah. I said, wait a minute, but you can't eliminate it. Yes, it can be zero. So it can be drug free entirely. I mean, as long as drug, uh, uh, alcohol. That, that's drug in a way, mm -hmm. once you consume it at a certain pace. So it can be zero. But the word eliminate means you're aspiring towards that target. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and you will go as close as you can. Every little bit that you advance saves millions. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a yes and no uh, answer, but, mm -hmm. but it can be phased and an achievement can be significant, sufficiently significant for the nation to be able to breathe. Mm. But now we are not with all this. Mm. I said at the at, at you know when I started the introduction that at, at first Nigeria was that a transit a drug transit country. Uh, at the moment, uh, are we still you know retaining <coughs> that status, or have we you know um, retrogressed? That speaking in terms of magnitude of you know the of the war that we are fighting. We have not improved. It's worse. That's where the committee was set. Over the years, things have continued to get worse, worse, worse. That's why the president, and it is a measure of his character, his human, uh, his humanistic tendency that made him, obviously, within the household, Her Excellency to play the very critical role, as we found out, mm -hmm. uh, led to uh, the committee to face and tackle this problem. Because at the bottom of the, the malaise in the country, including security also, um, that's where we are. Mm. So in, w without necessarily you know, profiling or doing a profiling uh, uh, you know, analysis, let's look at the gender age distribution and do spatial spread. You know, <clears> I, I <throat> talked about prevalence in one part of the country. Mm -hmm. Is that what you found out? No. Um, fortunately, there are scientific methodologies now. Mm. Um, there's no guesswork in this business. And uh, the, the Nigerian Bureau of Statistics, Ministry of Health, and the UNODC uh, engaged in a project on a survey to determine answers to these questions, funded by the European Union. Um, the, the, the response came out uh, just last year. It was found that whereas the global prevalence was about 5.6%, in the case of Nigeria, within the ages uh, of 15 and, and 64, the prevalence was almost double, beyond double actually, almost triple at 14.4% uh, prevalence, which actually translates to 14.3 million Nigerians uh, within that bracket. We also found that one in four uh, drug abusers in Nigeria are women. More than that, the, the, the impression 
and I myself carried the impression before, mm -hmm. was that the prevalence of drug abuse was worse in the north, especially with Boko Haram and so on. But the evidence uh, suggested the contrary. Actually, the prevalence is higher in the south, and I think there are reasons for that. Um, leading, unfortunately, uh, in this uh, wise, in the southwest geopolitical zone, where the prevalence is 22.4% within this age <coughs> bracket. Age bracket. Yes, um, followed by the south south with a prevalence of 16.6%, and then the southeast, 13.8% prevalence. That's the high. So that's where it is, and the northeast comes forth with a prevalence of 13.6%, mm. the northwest, 12%, and the north central uh, is the least with 10%. Some of the, uh, like Lagos, has a 3% prevalence, whereas Kano is 16%. That's like half of it. Oyo State is 23%, uh, if you look at it. Um, so it's, you know, it's like that. But I would think that perhaps the impression given uh, for the Northwest in the past was because of the opioids, especially the, the codeine, uh, consumption because uh, nationally 10.6 million Nigerians smoke cannabis of that lot mentioned, whereas for the opioids is 4.6 million. So you can see it's more than double the cannabis. And since it's growing in the south, um, I would think that would be the reason why the prevalence in the south is higher. <clears throat> so th these, these are some of the um, and in the northeast, the highest prevalence is not in Meduguri, Borno State, or Yobe or Adamawa, but actually it's in Gombe. Gombe State? That's right. Um, so that it's still more studies are ongoing to get to the root of some of the things, but, but that's the answer to your question. Mm. Hmm. Wonderful. I, 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 in my research, I got to know that those who those who you know deal in drug export and import actually take them to the communities you mentioned poverty could there be any other reason why the communities are their destination points yes because ultimately that's where the people live and the grassroots. So ultimately that is the target. So when you import through the ports or land borders, and we visited the ports, we visited the seaports, mm. airports, okay. land borders, we looked at it. Ultimately you have to, the trafficking organization makes its way down to the communities because where the, where the people uh, lie. And we found that even the Akara cellar with a basin mm. under it, or the person selling uh, goro, mm. uh, cola nuts under <laughs> the drugs. Then the patent medicine stores, there are over a million of them. Presently, like 70,000 patent medicine stores are clear. But over a million are not licensed. They are operating illegally and selling, instead of the over-the-counter paracetamols mm -hmm. and stuff, they even take admissions. They do drips, deliveries, and so on. So that's another challenge in the uh, supply side, which we, we faced and made recommendations. Mm -hmm. w w um, which is the flourishing traffic route? Is it the, the airport, the seaport, or the land borders? Sea. Actually, the seaports. Seaports? Oh, the seaports, the seaports, the seaports. The, the land, yes, you know, is wide and so on. But what will come through uh, Chad, Benin, is the seaports where and I have to, to, to commend the customs. Um, almost a hundred containers in the last couple of years have been seized. And if you look at it for Tramadol, so if you look at it, you will find that uh, over, over a billion 
of these pills are trapped uh, by, by, by the customs. And therefore, the scarcity it has shut the price up. And uh, at least it has reduced that aspect of, of drug abuse. Um, but there are other things that have sprung up in Nigeria, like methamphetamines, mm. which the Nigerian methamphetamine is so attractive. For a kg, it sells for $250,000 in some places in this world. But again, the NDLA, um, and that's an agency, which is a lead agency, and I know they're trying their best. Uh, they need to be strengthened, and all that is in our Your report. report. W what of the you know, airport staff, the, the, those, you know, and I'm asking this question because of a recent an incident involving a young Nigerian lady, you know, uh, who was detained in the Saudi prison, you know, for, for no, no fault of hers, simply because her, you know, they, they found substance, you know, concealed in her luggage, which, which she didn't do. So what is the level of connivance of this auxiliary airport staff? Yes, um, we, we, our committee, also raised that matter. That, that, that's there now. We went to Kano, and it, that, that's the place I made the, the statement, and I repeated in all the airports we visited that if an airline is caught with this type of nefarious activity, excuse me, putting or, or, or causing somebody to be caught with drugs which are not theirs, we will penalize the aircraft and it can go to seizing of that particular aircraft. And I did the same with the buses mm -hmm. <coughs> coming from other parts of Nigeria. We went to the bus stop in Kano and I met the bus owner and I told them the same thing. Your bus, if we find that there are drugs in your bus, we seize the bus. So you better make sure that the drivers and the helpers that you get are people that are above board. And the same thing we repeated uh, in the airport. First, they have to have better scanning and closed circuit so that they can see the whole line all the way to the aircraft. Mm. And they have to improve the methodology of giving. Fortunately, that was a business that I had also been in before. So I was able to also be part of the suggestions on how you, when you check in one luggage, mm. you must have a document in addition to that tag that at the other end it will suddenly become Two, two luggages. Mm. But back to your question also, critically is that there has to be better examination of the staff employed to work. They have to be well remunerated, mm. uh, better paid, and trained so that they don't fall uh, into this trap. Mm. Yes, but, but the seaports is definitely that because you know containers. Yes, yeah, the, the ship is big and it kind of takes hundreds of containers. Mm. So always the seaports, uh, that's where the Major threats. Mm. I, I, know, I know you've made <clears throat> recommendations, and, and one of those is advocacy. Advocacy, advocacy, and of course, ed education. But let me ask you there are, of course, people who are saying, look, in, in this you know, 21st century, where you know, economy is moving to knowledge economy, bioeconomy, and all that, there is need. Since in some parts of the country, like in earlier indicated southern part, southwest part of the country, you have farmlands, you know, cannabis farms in large quantity. Some are saying, look, why don't we do bioeconomy with these, some of these drug uh, farms, you know, turn them into valuable money spinning, you know, you know, issues. I mean, legalize cannabis, for instance, as you know, some other countries have done. Would that be part of what your recommendation? You are on the right track until the point where you mentioned <laughs> the cannabis. It's called crop substitution. That's what we have looked at and recommended. Mm -hmm. If you are growing cannabis, why don't we clear that out and do something else there that is not cannabis, that will give you legitimate income? So that's an extra, uh, that's an area which we recommended. But it will be cannabis because it even boggles the imagination. Here you are facing something that is practically killing you, making you crazy, mad, changing your behavior, violence. 
with all the security situation in the country, how on earth would anybody consider legalizing it? Because that input is going to be higher. And we've studied in those climes where this has mm. been legalized. And we found that the crime rate caused by ingestion of these legalized uh, drugs has spiraled. In the United States, we looked at it, three times more hospital admissions, greater crime. Because you see, when you take this, you're out of your mind, isn't it? It affects the brain, uh, your behavior, um, you get violent in some cases. And so, and that's when you are taken to your afraid so that uh, you are we, not we, caught. We've, we've seen cannabis but, but, gums. But now, yes, but now you are allowed to take it freely, especially when the pervading atmosphere is still there, like poverty. Mm -hmm. That's it. You solve okay. the problem. So, so that's, 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 that's the so, difference between them and us. <clears throat> the, you may say so, but we must not uh, fall into that trap. You talked, about you, you talked about advocacy and education. And that takes me to you know, my, my question. I'm, I'm sure you must have heard of people that are now called followers of the Malian movement. You, you know, they are currently being indoctrinated and, uh, in, in, into the drug syndicate. These are students, you know, secondary school students, pupils, tertiary institutions, and, and all that. And I, I'm wondering, what kind of advocacy is your you know, panel advocating? We must start with the family. <clears throat> That's the bottom, bottom line. We must start with the family. There's, there's need for more care, more love, more guidance, more counseling. Institution where, like it's having the Almagiri, mm. you give birth and then fling them out to go and beg. Well, there's no food now. When we were growing, we even kept in, in this part of the country, we knew that Almaji, they come and you keep the food. And when they come around the evening, you share it. It's not there anymore. So you are the Almaji wandering around no food, and somebody gives you a little pick, take this one, it will kill the hunger and make you even happier. That's how they get indoctrinated. And there are 10 million of those now, which do not form part of that 14.3 uh, million, because the age for that study was 15 to 64. <laughs> so you still have these Almagiris, they have not yet. Mm -hmm. They're not yet 15. Yes, and, and incidentally, there's another class that is not included. That is the class of people who are legitimately prescribed drugs by doctors. They prescribe drugs to finish after three months. That's the end. But they continue on their own. And they call it uh, shopping. They go to different pharmac pharmacies mm. and buy. So it is, it's, it's a huge... Uh, so now back to your question. Family has to start with the family. Because the destruction of family is one of the things. Is that part of the war against drug abuse? That yes. You, because you talked about declaring you know, a formal declaration of war against drug abuse. I want you to talk about it briefly. And also, you were quoted recently to have said that um, adverts of alcohol, you know, uh, uh, drugs that have alcohol, whatever, you know, should be stopped. Will that serve as, as a strong deterrent? Because I don't, I don't see it, it hasn't done so. I mean, okay, um, <clears throat> we'll put our recommendations yeah. have not been implemented yet. Yeah. We are waiting for the implementation. But quickly driving home the attack on uh, the Advocates. issue of, of uh, advocacy mm -hmm. after the family and the community and, and uh, the traditional institutions, uh, advocacy, government, yeah. media, NGOs, and so on, the school system, the school system, from primary school now, we must put in the curriculum. We have to drive this, and, and also we have this random testing for drugs in schools, in schools and public institutions, so that you know that at any time they're going to spring on you, so you better stay clean. But this so will require funding. 
Of course. The and and education doesn't, come doesn't cheap. have enough funding for that. We've put it there. The government and we believe and trust and, and uh, uh, are hopeful that uh, the president will fund this war adequately. So that's about the. So the, part the of your recommendation system. is for the, the budgetary allocation to education and, of course, mm -hmm. other uh, sectors, multi sectors, should be beefed up. The whole fight. The whole fight will be beefed up. But now, let's come back to the WADA that you said now, mm. the war against drug abuse. In a nutshell, and putting it in as concise a manner as I can, um, it has to start with a declaration of state of emergency for the war against yes. drug abuse. It has got to that point. And then we looked at the structural aspects in which we discovered and recommended that a new agency ought to be created, the National Drug Control Commission, which will coordinate the entire drug response in the country, monitor and implement the National Drug Control. Where, where will it be domiciled? In the presidency, yes, and it will be legislated. And then, of course, the fight for the supply of drug reduction and uh, law enforcement, and then the drug demand that we just mentioned, and finally, the, uh, the control drugs and their availability. There's a big problem today, um, especially in pain medication. A gentleman told me he was attending uh, a surgery in one of the government hospitals. A lady woke up in the middle of the surgery screaming with pain. And he said, what's going on here? And they were told, well, you know, the anesthesia, anesthesia. they had to re share it because there are other patients, patients. waiting. <clears throat> so the Minister of Health has the responsibility for ordering these uh, control drugs that I'm telling you today, for the last two to three years, they have not ordered even a pint. And what has that led to? People just bring anything uh, into the country. We went to the central medical stores and discovered in their books nothing. There, there, no importation by the federal government through the Ministry of Health, Health and so on. So these issues and then the distribution <clears throat> today, you see them hawking drugs everywhere on the head, wheelbarrows, in the sun. Even the sun kills the potency, no control. All this is within the report. How to do it? In less than 60 seconds, mm. we, we, yes, because we're more school, talk to us. You talked about rehabilitation centers. Mm -hmm. You know, yes. How, how does that pretend, you know, a, a measure, you know, to, to you know, check uh, drug abuse? Um, mostly um, the, the rehabilitation centers we are talking about concerns the addicts who have to be treated and rehabilitated. We found that in the whole country, there, there are just 31 rehab centers, um, very insufficient. So our, our committee recommended that in each community, there should be a small cell, working center within the community level. Local government also would have counseling centers integrated into the local, into the primary health care. But in each state, there should be a minimum of one rehab center per senatorial zone. <clears throat> this means we have to build capacity also. That's all part of the recommendations, how to achieve it, okay. because we have less than 200 psychiatrists in the whole country, so we okay. have to face that one. Okay. Then the medication should also be affordable, and the skills should be taught in this center, so that, and, and some help given, so that they don't go out and come back tomorrow. All right, Mohamed Buba Marwa, Chairman, Presidential Advisory Committee on Elimination of Drug Abuse, and of course, retired Brigadier General. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us on this edition this week. Thank you. And that's it for this week. I am Claire Dilabu Abdurazak. For me and the rest of my production crew, bye bye.